Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no holds barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome Kara Golden to the Reboot Chronicles. She is an entrepreneur and author of a great book called Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters, which details how she faced up to endless naysayers and triumph, including founding Hint Water and scaling it into a couple hundred million dollar company. Kara, it's good to see you. Great to see see you as well. Yeah, the um, you know, it's funny. I was uh, just talking to you before we, we got on set here and I was... <laughs> It, it was, we do have a lot of things in common. I usually don't talk about these things, but what the heck? It's like we both uh, are recovering uh, Diet Coke addicts. And uh, in your case, you turned it into a, a venture. So we'll talk about that. And we both actually um, sold or part of selling spin out companies, I call them. Uh, but we both sold them to AOL, which I think is hilarious. I was the CEO of Imagination Network and World Play Entertainment, which was spun out of AT&T. So we scaled that and then AOL acquired it. And then you were leading the charge at two market, which I think that was spun out of Apple and then later sold to AOL. Do, do I have that right? You have that exactly right. I think we we're just off by a couple of years. So uh, kind of a funny place to start. Maybe just maybe tell us about that journey, you know, the Apple uh, spin out. And, uh, and then it looks like you had a good time when you went to AOL as well. Yeah, well, it was sort of a, a funny story how I got there. I, I had moved to San Francisco and didn't know a soul. I had been living in, in New York and actually was engaged. And my husband had gotten, a, he was going to be a new attorney, wanted wow. to do something called tech law in 1994. And uh, so I decided I would start looking around for a role. I had been in media in New York and really wasn't sure that I wanted to work in a satellite role in media, you know, in San Francisco. So I was kind of looking around for my next thing. And the only brand that I thought of as it related to San Francisco was Apple. And when I figured out that Apple was in Cupertino, pretty far from San Francisco, I thought, I don't want to commute every day and we're not going to move down to uh, that part, that neck of the woods. And, and so as I was doing my research on kind of other companies uh, and looking at Apple in particular, I stumbled upon this little startup that had just spun out of Apple called Two Market. And it was um, a little known Steve Jobs idea inside of right. Apple that was doing right. Steve Jobs shopping. I remember. And, uh, yeah. And so, uh, you know, it was, five guys who had been at Apple, uh, wasn't in a garage, but it was pretty close. And I reached out and cold called one of them who had been, Walt Mossberg had written an article about them. And I just reached out to the guy and said, hey, I'd love to take you to coffee. And I just moved to the Bay Area. I honestly thought maybe I could just get to know some people here and network and try and figure out what I wanted to do next. I, I didn't think that I would be offered a job within a couple of days. And, and uh, you know, again, I didn't know anything about tech. Uh, for me, it was, it was really this intrigue around shopping and e-commerce that really kind of got me. And I thought, what's the worst that could happen? They'll, they'll fire me, right? They'll figure out that I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. and, yes. uh, Sometimes that's not the worst thing, but yes. Right. And, and so, uh, so that's when I, I jumped in and, and, you know, was sort of given the task of trying to figure out how the heck do we make money. Um, they had been running a business model that was uh, not really a growth, a sustainable company business model. It was like a percentage of sales, um, you know, not very much of a percentage. So definitely wasn't covering the cost of the business. And so uh, having been in media, I was at CNN prior uh, Ted Turner really drilled in our heads, like it's all about making money. Uh, so I was, I was ready to go and, and worked on figuring out how do we get retailers to sign up for uh, this, this CD-ROM disc. And uh, great stories, great memories, uh, meeting with people like Mickey Drexler at The Gap and 
uh, later when we were also working with one of our investors on their shopping platform called America Online. It's when I called up Jeff Bezos and, and he was just doing books. He was actually building bookshelves and I was helping him build a bookshelf in order to get a meeting with him. Uh, so many, many stories around that, that time. So interesting time in history for sure. Yeah, early days. It's funny. I, I actually moved to Silicon Valley the same year you did, though. I was from Chicago, and um, it was a uh, sort of those are some good go-go days. The early development of um, of technology, or at least the second phase of it, well into the third or fourth now. Um, so let's flash forward now to you know Hint Water, which is a fascinating company, um, which we'll get into. But you had no experience, at least what I could tell in like, you know, FM's, you know, CG, fast moving consumer goods, those of you that aren't tracking that. And um, what, what made you want to start like a flavored water business, for lack of a better word, and, uh, you know, kind of actually selling it online, which was, you know, maybe not as popular back then. Um, yeah. how, did that, how did that all come together? <laughs> well, I was taking a couple of years off, I had started my family, I finally uh, America Online acquired our startup to market, and I was there yep. until 2001. And then I was taking a couple of years off to actually uh, stay in San Francisco. I was on the plane every week, and I thought, you know, I've got a young family. I, I want to get to know them. And uh, my husband was at a company called Netscape in Silicon Valley, and a little more difficult for him to move given you know, that he passed the California bar. And so we were, we were here, um, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. <clears throat> so I was, I was enjoying being a mom, uh, was really focused, I think, like a lot of parents are, especially in the early days on what I was putting into my kids' bodies. I think one day after I felt like I had really gotten into the groove of figuring out what they needed, I looked down at my diet soda, diet Coke in particular, and saw the ingredients. And I thought I would never give this drink to my kids. Why am I okay giving it to myself? And that's when I thought, maybe I should stop. Maybe I should just stop drinking it and see what would happen. I had been mm -hmm. trying to lose weight over the years. I had developed terrible adult acne, which I had never even had as a teenager and never connected them with what I was putting into my body. Um, but I thought I'm gonna give it a try and, and see if it makes me feel better in some way. And it, what was so interesting, I remember I shared with my husband that I was not going to drink Diet Coke anymore. So I said, so don't put it in the refrigerator because don't tempt me at all. Like, I'm just not going to do it at all. And right. he said, you've been drinking Diet Coke for a lot of years. Like, are you sure you can do this? And I said, I'm, I can do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to focus on it and I'm going to do it. And I did it. I stopped drinking it. I started drinking plain water. And after two and a half weeks, I lost over 20 pounds. My skin cleared up. And that's when I really started looking at, wow, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. Why aren't more people talking about what they put into their body and trying to fix some of these things that, you know, are, are really not making them feel great or, or in my case, like, you know, making sort of challenging me with, with losing weight or whatever. Why aren't, people, more people talking about these diet sweeteners. And I thought there's just one problem though. And that's that I was so bored of plain water. I wanted to scream. And yep. I had grown up in Arizona where I should have been drinking a lot more water, but I didn't because it just was boring. So that's when I thought in order to get me drink water, I'm going to start slicing up fruit, fruit, throwing it in. And, um, you know, it's funny, I would see friends of mine, mostly from tech, that, that was like my community, and people would say, oh, what kind of fruit do you have in your water? I was like the water, I was like the fruit water lady. You're the fruit water lady. It wasn't your mantra, drink water, not sugar? It was, and I, I just kind of laughed because people would say, oh, you know, what do you, what do you got? I'd be 
you know, out on a walk. Oh, soccer games. Here she comes. Here she comes. And she's got fruit in her water. And, you know, I I mean, I I was sort of fascinated by the fact that people were so fascinated with what kind of fruit I had in my water. And and I, I just at one point thought, you know, okay, I figured out how to drink water, but maybe it would be a lot easier if there was a product like this in the store. And so when I looked for a product like Hint, I was somewhat shocked that I couldn't find it. I looked in the Bay Area, I looked on the East Coast, I, you know, it spent like a year searching for this product, which was fruit and water and no sweeteners. And yeah, there, were, there was flavored water then, but it was just still filled with things you can't even pronounce. Well, my... and the, the only thing that was somewhat close to Hint was there were carbonated versions of mm. Hint that were like seltzer. Everything had sodium in it at the time. They don't today. Um, right. But they were using all kinds of, they weren't using real stuff. Um, and, and so that's when I really started to think, I just want to still water. I don't want the carbonation, not because I thought carbonation was bad, but because I really wanted to drink a lot of it all day. And I thought, I don't want to be burping all day long or feeling yeah. cold, right? And, car- and carbonation actually dehydrates you too, so. Yeah, and I just, wa- I didn't want it. And it, it's, so that's when I really started thinking too, as I was going into grocery stores that no one was doing it. Um, I should, I've got this great idea to do it. Uh, but I think part of the fun, frankly, was that I was, I was just ready to learn again. And I think that that's something that I, you know, share in, in my book and, and share with a lot of entrepreneurs, when you switch industries, I didn't intentionally switch industries. I wasn't, I, I didn't feel like, okay, I'm done with tech. I never want to be in here anymore. But I saw this problem and I saw something that I was so curious about that I had an idea for that I thought I'm going to go do it. And, and all along the way, even, you know, 16 and a half years later, just I would run into all these problems that I thought, okay, now what do I do? Okay, now I'm going to go and try and solve this problem. But I think whenever you find something that you're curious about, that you feel like you're capable of solving something like that, then, you know, you're like, I don't know, I could always go back to tech. Yeah, for some for some people, it scares them. I've always had the privilege or dumb luck of switching from industry to industry so i get it it's actually an exciting period but uh, for others it's a it's a frightening thing we maybe we can get into that when we touch on the book in a sec um you know you guys were also like i don't know one of the uh, poster uh, people of uh, the COVID era meaning you grew really rapidly during uh, this this era and um, a couple hundred million dollars is what i've heard the companies doing these days so what what did you learn about I guess, marketing in that crazy period. Actually, as we're recording it, we're still in the period, but it's, yeah, what, uh, what, any quick takeaways for folks that like really like put you guys, I mean, you were already on the map, but it clearly accelerated you. Well, it's interesting. We, uh, we already had a direct to consumer business that was started. So Hmm. it, it may sound for anybody, uh, listening and especially in, in tech where Beverages just, people weren't really selling beverages online. It was very small business. I mean, radical. It, yeah. It, and, and so we already had it all set up. Uh, it, the, we, we just hadn't really kind of ignited it yet. And so when COVID hit and we had about 15% of our office business was in offices like Google and Facebook and many others throughout the world. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that business all shut down when everybody was staying at home and sheltering in place. And so we just really threw the gas onto the direct to consumer business. And we already had, you know, a list of over a million um, people who had, who had purchased online. So we were able to retarget yeah. and go back and um, get people to buy. But I think like that there was a massive problem that was going on that we saw 
early on with uh, with really getting your your product to the shelf. There were a lot of kind of broken pieces that consumers might not have really realized. You heard about toilet paper, um, you know, being unavailable and bleach and water. It, I mean, Hint was the same issue in stores, and and so there were EDI issues that were broken. There were you know distributors that weren't able to keep up with things and, and COVID was hitting really hard. So people were really relying on, you know, people um, for the most part. And I think that's where we were able to kind of just yep. solve Yeah. Especially in the health, beauty and wellness space, a lot of it just accelerated people taking care of them. So the fact that you've squeezed in EDI in there uh, means you, you definitely are a, a tech um, pioneer. <laughs> I haven't heard that say, it, it's a technology term folks. But, um, and, and you know, speaking of health, beauty, and wellness, you guys, you also, then you launched a uh, deodorant, you launched a sunscreen, which I've tried. It's pretty awesome, pretty pure. Um, what was the strategy move there? What, what, what was going on? Was it moving more into health, beauty, and wellness? Well, I, I think for me, Hint has always been about solving a problem, right? It's solving a problem, getting, initially getting me to drink more water. Uh, so why yeah. not start it in my kitchen? But for, I had a scare with skin cancer on my nose a few years ago, and I was looking for a sunscreen that didn't have this ingredient oxybenzone in it. And the only options that I found that didn't have oxybenzone in it were mineral-based sunscreens. And at the time, mineral-based sunscreens were all white and pasty, yeah. and I yeah. put it on my face. A little too clinical, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and so there were really two things. I, I decided to create my own sunscreen um, that was clear, that actually smelled good versus uh, like you've just been to the beach, right? And, <laughs> and COVID. But yeah, in yeah. addition, I wanted to, I was shocked at how inexpensive a lot of these ingredients were to actually create a sunscreen and how consumers frankly were not winning in, in yeah. this situation so when i would that means to, uh so you're, you're basically saying really good margins there very good margins and so when i would go to the dermatologist i was able to get a sunscreen like what i had created in my kitchen but it was 50 60 dollars and i thought that's criminal. Like if you really feel like you need to wear sunscreen, it shouldn't be that expensive. I mean, it just seemed backwards to me. And again, going back to why I developed Hint, it seemed like a natural brand extension. What we figured out that I thought was fascinating when we launched first the sunscreen and then the deodorant and some others, sometimes people will enter into, I call it the room, the uh they've seen hint right maybe they work at google or they they were there visiting or they were at whole foods and and they saw the bottles but for one reason or another they weren't ready to drink it and then they saw the sunscreen and they were really ready to have a sunscreen that didn't have oxybenzone that smelled like grapefruit versus yep. and, a, and a familiar and brand too the carryover the halo of that entry point builds trust with the consumer to go and try these other products. And I hear it constantly from consumers who come in through, maybe they were looking for a deodorant that didn't have the aluminum in it. Maybe they didn't have, or, or maybe they were looking for a hand sanitizer that smelled like tangerine. I mean, whatever it is, that eventually brings them in to try some other categories and hopefully consume the other categories too. Um, but it really goes back to, to the original intent. I didn't start Hint to start a beverage company. I started Hint to solve a problem, initially with me and then to help others. And we've done that. Yeah, it's the best mission you can have. Didn't you uh, start it with your husband, uh, Theo, is it? Yeah, well, Theo was an intellectual. Or he, or, or he got involved at some point. But yeah, everyone always wants yeah. to know, what's it like to work with your spouse? It's uh, I always chalk that up as not a good idea, but it sounds like it was great for you. You know, we, uh, yeah, four kids and, and a company. Yeah, and, a busy uh, household. 
right of going on 27 years of marriage. And, oh, congratulations. Uh, That's awesome, by the way. Best pal and uh, number one fan uh, in both directions. I mean, we're very different skill sets. So I always tell people it doesn't work for everybody, but I think that the key thing is, is finding somebody, whether it's, you know, a, a partner in life or a partner in a business that really has a different skill set because if they don't I think that it's not it's not a recipe to win right it's like I, yeah, I think yeah. the key thing is being able to have somebody that you can bounce ideas off that really appreciate what each other does and and I think for for him I mean he had just never I don't think he ever had an appreciation for brand or marketing um it was just he had lawyers always, usually lawyers usually don't but it's good to have a lawyer in the family too yeah so i i think you know for him he appreciated that in the way that i spoke about it and he mm. you know was was uh intrigued curious all of those things and so i mean initially he was just helping me load up the car with cases of of hint and uh and mm. deliver them to stores and then i I, I gave him a, I gave him a pay raise. So he was uh, <laughs> nice. Oh yeah, gosh. Let's, uh, that, let's talk about the book. Him a dollar. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's talk about the book here. I'm holding it. There those of you on video, uh, undaunted, um, I'm about halfway through it. I love some of your, uh, I can identify with a lot of some of these things too, I guess maybe that's it, but I, I really, really enjoy it. Um, what does it mean to live like an undaunted life? I and mean, that's a pretty powerful word. Yeah, I, I think more than anything, you're, you have to appreciate not knowing <laughs> what's going to come next and believing that you can, which mm -hmm. I think is, is the first time you have to go out and live undaunted uh it's it's tough but when you start to look at history it rarely turns out as bad as you were ever afraid that it would right it's it's a it, it's in, and instead i think it usually ends up being better different um you learn things that maybe you didn't learn. And, you know, one of the chapters, I don't think you're there yet, uh, is, you know, even in, in personal life, I, I have a situation with the Grand Canyon where, you know, you can walk into a situation, be as prepared as possible, but, you know, it, you're not always going to be prepared. And instead, you're going to learn a lot of things. And sometimes it's not just about the journey and the experience you learn about who you are and what you can withstand and how creative you can be <laughs> lots of things along the way which you know you're sounds like you've had many experiences of living undaunted yourself so you probably relate to me talking about this as well yeah that's where that's where reboot came from actually it's like rebooting yourself your life your business um your family whatever it is but but kind of having that innocent childlike, I don't know what the conclusion is going to be, is I'm paraphrasing what you just said, I think is really powerful and I think is what scares people a lot. Do you, do you deal with um, fear in this a lot in, in, in the book? Because that most people okay. don't realize it, but that is what's holding us back often. Yeah, and I think it's it really is kind of a, a mindset to not allow yourself to uh, overthink things, right? And and instead, uh, I, I think one thing that I, I am constantly talking about is complacency will kill you. That doesn't mean you can't stop and regroup and think about, okay, what do I do next? But complacency, I think, is is something that creates a lot of fear for people, right? They can't, they don't know what way to move. And you have to be flexible. Uh, you have to be willing to be very aware and know that you might be going down one lane and it's just not working. And then you've got to turn around and go the other way. And there's, it can be exhausting, right? And, but I think that that is the piece that 
helps people get through their careers, that it's not an either or more than anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's another key word. It, I, I, I'm just criticizing myself here. Might as well. Um, I find that overthinking stuff happens to me a lot, business and personal. And then I get to that moment. I'm like, oh my gosh, this was a piece of cake or this was actually lovely. Or, this was not as bad as whatever it is. So you kind of overthinking is, is, is um, it's good in some cases because it's, it's gotten us to where we have been successful in some cases and others. It, it just clearly, um, holds you back i found and the um what do you find is the best way to uh release that i guess well allow, allow yourself to flow with the unexpected is yeah i i do think it's flow but it's also to uh, to think about that moving in a direction even if it isn't the right direction you're going to be able to learn a lot of things along the way. And again, I think that I think this stopping and not doing anything, it, hmm. it not only creates fear, but it creates boredom. Right. And I think you start to pick at yourself and and, you know, and not appreciate what you have accomplished when you sit in that zone. So I think more than anything, it's really I, I think that this whole idea of continuing to move and continuing to do something, and then also don't be afraid of learning new things. So, yeah, we've talked about that a lot. Um, you know, it used to be called lifelong learning, but that became an old term. You know, a lot of military leaders talk about this. It's like you, the, you know, as you stop and sit, it that's when the danger lies ahead um, and it just comes and greets you versus you're the one who's moving and, and getting momentum. You said something else though, that was interesting. It's like the same amount of work you said, it can be exhausting. Okay. And I find I can do something and w one day I'll be exhausted from it. And, and the other day it's like, I'm totally exhilarated with this process. And I, I don't know if it's because it's just in a, the mood you're in or how you're processing it, but it was the exact same task basically. So. Do you well, talk about I, that much, like like kind of training your mind? Do you get into, into anything like that? Because I, I think a lot of it's internal. Yeah, I do think a lot of it's internal. And I think it's also, I mean, one of the things that I share a lot in just in building out a team is that I always want to understand from the beginning mm -hmm. what different departments do. So I would say that you know, I'm definitely brand and marketing and that's sort of what I've grown up in, but I do know a little bit about EDI. I do know a little bit about <laughs> engineering and code and, and, um, and, you know, finance and, and enough to get me in trouble in all of these areas. And I think that that's something that satisfies my own curiosity. Um, but when I find that I'm starting to get bored by it, which is different than not understanding something. Right. I'm not passionate about those things. That doesn't mean that I don't try and understand it and get as far as I can. And then I hire people who all they want to do is do spreadsheets all day long. All they want to do all day long is, is do supply chain, whatever it is. And I think that that's a really important thing to know about yourself too. What do you like doing every day? Because if you're pushing yourself to do something that you just aren't that right. passionate about, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go learn it. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot about finding your purpose. I I, I teach this and, and help uh, execs with it. And I, I simplify it down to it's, it's about the connected tissue between fun and money and impact. And that's how you can kind of fight up board and, and continue to grow and everyone's got a formula for purpose, but what I tell them is don't expect to get it from your company. You've got to give it to yourself. And if you can blend it in to work, great. Um, my question to you is how can CEOs kind of, you know, contrary to what I just said, it's hard to develop it long-term in companies, but how can they better create a sense of pride and purpose and passion with employees, you know, protect that and, and use it as a competitive weapon, which it seems like you did at Hint. Yeah, well, I mean, going back to that example, I think really understanding what what people do and yeah, what it's a good and, start. Yeah, I mean, that's I think that there's a there are a number of people who are hired in to maybe you're hired in to be the CEO of a company to grow a company or get it, you know, cash flow positive. What whatever it is that doesn't that 
doesn't stop you or shouldn't stop you from actually understanding what the challenges are that a direct to consumer leader is facing right now and how they think about what's what are their stresses every single day that may not have to do uh necessarily with money initially or growth or whatever but what are the things that they need and as a leader you go in and try and figure those things out you have a lot more empathy right for what they're living every single day that maybe might not show up on you know the the weekly that, that that they're giving to you exactly sounds great i'm gonna have to leave it there uh Kara, really want to thank you for uh, joining us you've been listening to Kara golden on the reboot chronicles this is dean tobias thanks for joining us and we'll see you soon